Good afternoon. What we're going to do over the next several hours, and we will break it up into parts, so don't worry, you don't have to sit in front of your computer for seven hours or so. But what we're going to do is try to break it up into our segments, and we're going to talk about periodontal surgery, but with a full understanding biologically why each procedure is undertaken. The key to doing surgery really is beforehand knowing why. Because once you know why, the how becomes relatively easy. If you're a beginner, this is going to probably be a little over your head. Uh, it is critical, in my opinion, that you had watched part A with uh, a long seven-hour explanation of, of really uh, biology related to uh, keeping teeth. And we talked, we talked about histology, we talked about physiology and everything, in which we're going to go again in this uh, next several hours. We're going to break it down into, first we're going to start with flaps, which obviously you go through each procedure, and we'll talk biologically why we do what we do. But we're going to start now with the uh, simplest area, and we're going to work towards the most complex treatment, which will happen sometime about seven hours from now if you don't mind. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about reflection of a flap in the posterior region. And what I want you to understand is, and, and a lot of you will, is that when you reflect a flap, you better know beforehand what you want. That scalpel is going to do nothing more than what you tell it to do. And if you don't know really biologically what you're doing, you may create bigger problems several years down the road than you expected. But the reason I start with the posterior is for, it's for obvious that if you do make a little mistake in the posterior, it's not as significant as making a mistake in the anterior. And so when we look at our reflection of our flap or, or treatment related to a flap, the most crucial part of, of which all, all these are, but is understanding you want maximum blood supply to the flap that you're reflecting. Because if you do, it's going to have nutrition over the next week and should do very, very well. When you compromise blood supply, that's when you get necrosis and that's when you get a lot more discomfort for the patient. The less trauma that you create for the tissue, again, the better the healing will be. And that's what we're going to talk today or over the next several hours is how to handle tissue, how to treat bone and so on so that it's atraumatic. We want to be very careful with our papilla because that's how we prevent black triangles. And certainly uh, we want to understand that there's a certain thickness of papilla. And if you create too thin of, an, of a papilla, you can get sloughing. The objective is, is to take the tissue, reflect it, have it go to sleep while you're doing your surgery, and then replace it just coronal to the bone and as close to primary closure as you can, and making sure the flap is immobile. And if you treated it kindly at a week, you won't even know you did surgery. And so we're going to look mainly here, you know, we're going to talk uh, in a couple hours about biologic width, but this is more about how to make an incision. And a lot of times I see people talking about uh, reflecting a intracircular inter, flap where you go along the uh, enamel and you simply reflect the flap back. And the problem here is you're reflecting epithelium. The problem with epithelium is that it sloughs every seven days. So what appeared again, there it is. We know this is a junctural epithelium, but that's nothing more Again, to epithelium, there's no real connective tissue in it. <clears throat> so that, <clears throat> excuse me, if you were to make an incision and try to reflect back the epithelium, in fact, when you replace your flap, you could actually be creating a situation that it could not attach. Because there's epithelium that will disappear in a week. And this could prevent, actually, attachment of the flap. You may not know about it for a year. But you may get what's called a long junctural epithelial attachment, which is very weak. So we want to remove this portion of the tissue. Whether we remove a little connective tissue really, in my opinion, doesn't matter. The key is to make sure that all the intercircular and junctural epithelium is removed. So we'd like our incision to be angled so that it hits the bone 
And this, to me, would be done this way, whether we're doing a full thickness flap or a partial thickness flap. And so this obviously is a case where there is periodontal disease, which hopefully most of the cases we're treating are for a reason. We're not just doing it for the heck of it. So our incision is going to run at an angle almost like you could say parallel to the tooth. And it is key that it hits bone. You don't really want your first incision to come out in the tissue. You'd rather have it come out and then hit bone at, again, as I say, a parallel angle. And we're going to remove all this epithelium. We don't want it. And then we can come in here if you want to then take your scalpel and come along here, you know, and hit the bone again. But what I usually do is take an 11 or 12 uh, curette or a, a Goldman Fox number four, and I'm going to scoop out all this in, all this epithelium, plus many times this tissue is going to be made up of granulation tissue, which is from inflammation, which is very poor tissue, and we never want to take it with us in the flap. And then part three, again, you would scoop this area out, and you would take it out with a, you know, a number four Goldman Fox. This tissue should not be included into the flap. So it's crucial that you remove all epithelium and granulation tissue that all the intercircular and junctural epithelium is removed. So we'd like our incision to be angled so that it hits the bone. And this, to me, would be done this way whether we're doing a full thickness flap or a partial thickness flap. And so this obviously is a case where there is periodontal disease, which hopefully most of the cases we're treating are for a reason. We're not just doing it for the heck of it. So our incision is going to run at an angle almost like you could say parallel to the tooth. And it is key that it hits bone. You don't really want your first incision to come out in the tissue. You'd rather have it come out and then hit bone at, again, as I say, a parallel angle. And we're going to remove all this epithelium. We don't want it. And then we can come in here if you want to then take your scalpel and come along here, you know, and hit the bone again. But what I usually do is take an 11 or 12 uh, curette or a, a Goldman Fox number four, and I'm going to scoop out all this, in, all this epithelium. Plus many times this tissue is going to be made up of granulation tissue, which is from inflammation, which is very poor tissue, and we never want to take it with us in the flap. And then part three, again, you would scoop this area out and you would take it out with a, you know, a number four Goldman Fox. This tissue should not be included into the flap. So it's crucial that you remove all epithelium and granulation tissue, which you hopefully had left on the tooth or in that area, and then take your flap, which is just healthy tissue. So we must remove all the epithelium as it's going to slough away in seven days and create, and this could create a, a situation where your tissue does not attach other than a long junctural epithelium. And again, what we want to look at is, and I show this to you because there's a huge difference between a full thickness flap, which we're going to go over each individual one. But in either case, in my real opinion, is that if we angle down and we hit bone, I don't care. That would be my first start of full thickness flap, no, no matter what, is straight down. This is a split thickness flap, again, where you would just say remove the epithelium and junctional epithelium and keep the connective tissue. Um, more power to you if you do this. I'm very comfortable with A and B. Either one is important. But I, I kind of like the fact with that we're going to, in fact, keep more tissue in the flaps so you can't perforate as much. But here, again, if you want to come straight in and remove just a circular area, that's fine. But remember, you now have to make another incision coming straight down. And so we're going to talk about the reflection of a flap in the posterior region. For obvious reasons, again, let's start learning the most safe area to treat and, and treating the flap in the posterior, by the way, is totally different than the anterior. And where I prefer to use is a 12D blade for the mandibular arch. It's double cutting, both sides cut. 
which allows you to go back and forth, mesial to distal, distal to mesial, and it's just my preferred burr, excuse me, my preferred scalpel. If you find you can use something different, you use what works for you. This is what works for me. And so what I do, there's my 12D, and the key to doing a interproximal flap is that your 12 goes as far lingually as possible. And it meets up with, you know, in the middle of the, of the tooth and approximately is what we call the col, an area that's just kind of area of epithelium, which again serves no purpose. So we would come from a distal or mesial and we would go as far lingually as possible so that we can take as much of the papilla as possible. The beauty of having provisionals is we can go farther lingually. If you have natural teeth, without crowns or provisionals, let's say, I should say provisionals, you can't go very far. And you're not going to get as much of a papilla as possible, which is going to prevent you from getting primary closure if, if you can. And so you're going to go from the distal first and then the mesial, and now you're going to lift out, never removing it, this beautiful thick papilla, which you're going to be able to lay back and it's going to fill in as much as possible the interproximal to help to get primary closure and also to help to prevent black triangles, even in the posterior. And so when we move to the maxillary arch, we have the same concept. We're going to use a different scalpel. We're going to use a 12C blade. It's pretty thin, pretty narrow. And we're going, going to go as far lingually as possible. We want to get the largest papilla we can. So we want to go from the distal. Again, if you're really, you know, you've been doing surgery for a while, you could do this in one simple movement. You would go as far distal as possible. Uh, I mean, on the distal, as far lingually as possible, and simply turn your blade and come back around the, the other angle, line angle right out, and the papilla would be full. But if you're, you know, you're not that comfortable and approximately, then you would simply go to the Lingual as far as possible, then come over to the mesial and go to the lingual again as far as possible. And you would be able to pull out a nice, big, beautiful papilla. Notice how it's formed. It's formed exactly the way we want it to look after we completed our surgery. Always try to think before you start, how do you want the end result? Don't just start. Start in your mind envisioning what the end result should look like. And so when we move to the lingual, it's a similar motion. We want to go now as far to the buckle as possible. See what we're trying to do? We're trying to keep our papillas fat and thick. Now remember, if there's granulation tissue, we always want to remove any inflamed tissue. We don't want to carry that with our flap. So that's going to be your decision, and I'm going to show you as we move along what granulation tissue looks like, and it's going to be your decision as to when to remove inflamed tissue, which you should do 100% of the time, but you may have to think a little harder how to keep the papilla as full as possible. But again, we move to the distal. We went from the mesial, <clears throat> as you can see here. Now we go to distal, and we're going to take that papilla out as thick as possible. Now, I find this to be very interesting because when I started out doing surgery, I was always taught to do large areas of large papilla, excuse me, large flaps, so that I would get maximum blood supply. And as time goes on, I see we're getting into these tiny little flaps. And in my opinion, little flaps, you see less, you tend to tra uh, traumatize more and you can also do decrease blood supply. And that's why we always make our flap in a trap of trapezoid form where the base of the flap is larger because that means there's going to be more blood supply to the flap. The flap should always have a large base. So I like to take pictures that are kind of incorrect and just explain why. Never ever would you want to make an incision on the direct buckle of any tooth? This is the weakest area. Obviously, there's more blood supply and tissue in approximately. So this could be a larger mistake. And you could get sloughing of the entire flap. 
And remember, these two white lines signified what a trapezoid flap looks like. The base has much more blood supply, excuse me, and the coronal portion, less of a, uh, you know, it's tapered. So the blood supply is maximum to this flap, though this is incorrect. Once again, I try over my years to get away from vertical incisions. And this again is a case that's done, it's done, whatever. It, this tr gentleman tried to do the best he can. But when you learn about osseous surgery and you learn about tori and excess ptosis, you're going to find that once you put a vertical incision and you've compromised your ability to move on, or you may have to reflect the flap and then close this vertical incision. But if you're treating these two teeth, you have to at least include one more tooth. All crown lengthening involves at least three teeth if you're only treating one. The tooth you're treating plus the adjacent teeth because you're going to have to correct the bone over an area. So basically right now he's created a situation that he's probably going to have to reflect the flap if he's aware of what osseous surgery looks like. This is what I find that people take courses GPs will take a course and only learn the how. They will not understand the why. So I'm going to teach you the why today. If you want to do it differently, fine, but I'm going to explain to you how to make sure that when you're finished, it's the result you wanted. So here's a case again where the uh, flap was reflected, a tiny little flap, so I don't know what he's going to do. You can see the fracture goes further than this, how he's even going to treat it. But he's taking, he didn't go past the mucogingival junction. So the elevator, whatever he is using, is traumatizing this flap totally. And in fact, it's cutting the blood supply and can cause necrosis. He's bending the flap back, which is taking a vascular in the tissue and severing it. So if you're going to make such a small flap, which again, I don't even recommend, but you would all have to go all the way up into the vestibule. And certainly he was doing trapezoid, uh, you know, more blood supply, but totally compromising the flap. So then when he put it back, he was totally unaware of look how sick that flap is right now. It's been terribly traumatized. And I would say if he showed this case at a week later, this flap would be gone it would slough away from the trauma, traumatization. This is how we deal with treatment. We think beforehand biologically. And what is also interesting is he's treating this one tooth. He's got recession here. This is just looking at a spot area. He easily could have made incisions over and done a small little graft there and taken care of that problem also. But again, he's looking at a tunnel. He's not looking at the whole picture. And with this much trauma, I can assure you at a week, if he took a picture, you would probably see the roots showing three or four millimeters. So here's a case that I'm doing. And I'd like to show you why I recommend what I do based on my treatment. And I found when I used to do these small incisions, I would start to get tearing of the flap. But all I really had to do was reflect the flap one more little tooth to that distal there and then move this tissue out of the way, which I did, the uh, suction's looking at it, but you'll see. And then I can treat the area. But more importantly, the flap is going to a sleep. You see my flap, it gets pushed down, it's free, and goes to sleep for the period of time where I'm doing surgery. It is not being traumatized, and it has maximum blood supply. I didn't really compromise the blood supply. So let's do this case together. We're, we're going to, you know, come back a little bit. You know, we've made our incision with our uh, 12 blade that we use for the uh, mandibular arch. And we're going to do a full thickness flap at least a portion of the way. And then depending upon whether what I feel with the bone, we may do split thickness. But to, to me, if you do a full thickness, it's okay. But the end of the day, you'll be doing a split thickness like a full thickness. You won't even care. It's going to be so easy to you. But look where my elevator is. Let's say I was to stop 
at the distal of the bicuspid, which I didn't. You notice I went all the way to, to the um, mesial almost of the second, of the first bicuspid. Even though I'm only treating 18 and 19, I went two teeth further. Because when I had taken my finger, I, I feel the buccal surfaces. I could feel a thickness of bone. And sure enough, there's a little circumferential defect and there's excessive bone. I kept the periosteum here, which it, my recommendation to you here would have to, to do a full thickness flap. I've done this for 40 years, but if you did a full thickness flap after feeling the bone, then you'd you know, simply have the periosteum down here, which would be no big deal. I will push this down the periosteum and then bring it back up. But more importantly, I'm talking about extension of your flap. And let's see why. I'm going to treat, let's say I was just, I left my flap and I stopped right here on the distal of number 20 or the second bicuspid. Now we've made our incision with our uh, 12 blade that we use for the uh, mandibular arch. And we're going to do a full thickness flap at least a portion of the way and then depending upon whether what I feel with the bone we may do split thickness but to, to me if you do a full thickness it's okay but the end of the day you'll be doing a split thickness like a full thickness you won't even care it's going to be so easy to you but look where my elevator is and let's say I was to stop at the distal of the bicuspid which I didn't you notice I went all the way to to the um, mesial almost of the second of the first bicuspid, even though I'm only treating 18 and 19, I went two teeth further. Because when I had taken my finger, I, I feel the buccal surfaces, I could feel a thickness of bone, and sure enough, there's a little circumferential defect and there's excessive bone. I kept the periosteum here, which it, my recommendation to you here would have to, to do a full thickness flap. I've done this for 40 years, but if you did a full thickness flap, after feeling the bone, then you'd you know, simply have the periosteum down here, which would be no big deal. I will push this down, the periosteum, and then bring it back up. But more importantly, I'm talking about extension of your flap. And let's see why. I'm going to treat, let's say I was just, I left my flap and I stopped right here on the distal of number 20 or the second bicuspid. Well, as I did my osseous to create a parabolic arch architecture we're going to talk about, I would have left a huge ledge in the bone. There would be no way to get rid of it because my tissue would be right here. And because I didn't see it, I couldn't treat it. And then a bigger statement that I must say to you is, you don't know what you don't know. You don't even know you created a problem because you're not fully understanding physiology and biology. You simply saw someone do a case and do a mini flap and thought you could do that. But see what we had to do? We had to go all the way to the first bicuspid. So I have this area here and I've been able to correct it now. See how I've created, this is called a parabolic architecture. The bone mimics the soft tissue. See how it flows like a wave? Well, that's what the tissue is going to do regardless. So if we make the bone and soft tissue mimic each other, there is a great likelihood we're going to get zero pocketing and we're going to get a perfect connective tissue attachment with a nice sulcus because the two mimic each other. But more importantly, look at the bone. The bone has this beautiful flow like a wave, but I had to go all the way, in fact, too the distal of the cuspid before I could effectively create this environment. So look what we've created, a parabolic architecture, which is what the soft tissue is going to do no matter what. And we would like the bone to mimic the soft tissue. So when I, I, I can't express enough to you, remember this line. If you see it, you can treat it. So when you see these people doing mini flaps and little flaps, think in your mind, what happens if there's a defect one tooth over? You couldn't treat it. And once you get proficient at laying a flap, you could do the entire mouth and the patient wouldn't know it. Because once I take that flap that's been sleeping and putting back on maximum blood supply, at a week you would never even know the flap was reflecting.
So this is critical. And so when I ask you to diagnose before you pick up your scalpel and start, what I do at my exams and then repeat at the time of surgery is I take my finger and I'll run it on the buccal surfaces and I'll tell my assistant, thick, you know, thick tori, so on and so forth, but I will know before I ever start whether I must do a full thickness flap. Because if there's excess bone there, I can't split the tissue. So I shouldn't even try it. So I've felt, I've taken my finger, I've run it across here, and I know that the bone is thick. So let's remember what we're going to do. We're going to take our scalpel, and we're going to go as far lingually as possible. I would say to those that are not real comfortable, that have been do doing surgery for a couple of years, do it, do it in, in two steps. You know, certainly the buckle, you're going to go around like I showed you, and you're going to leave the sulcular area, but you're going to go to bone, and you're going to reflect it back. But in approximately, we want to keep the papilla full, so as go as far to the lingual as possible. Go on the mesial, mesial. If you have to take your scalpel out, turn it back, and then go on the distal, and you'll have this beautiful, thick papilla that has maximum tissue size, and maximum blood supply. That's the critical part, maximum blood supply. And you would go around each tooth and you would bring the papilla back. Remember, you will have to stop where in approximately there's the col, the C-O-L, because the col is actually a concavity and won't even allow you to go further because it's all, <coughs> it's all epithelium, which you don't want anyhow. You would take your elevator. Now remember, this is a full thickness flap. And you will push the tissue. You will put the elevator on bone and gently go back and forth, pushing the, back, the tissue back, you know, out, outward, little by little. But you don't push hard here because then you could tear the flap right here. So you may push a little, push a little, push a little, push a little, push a little. And then you will reflect your flap to where it's now released and what is it doing? It's going to sleep. You want to leave it alone. You don't want to traumatize it for the next half hour or whatever time it takes. Now remember, I've done nothing yet. Look at the ledge in the tooth. It's just the way life is. That, you know, that may have been where the old margin was and, and the defect here in the bone. And we have a crater right here. So even though I'm talking about a flap, what I'm going to do is get your imagination for the future. Like if you start to see things now, then by the time we get to doing definitive osseous surgery, it's going to be easy for you. You're going to understand everything because each time I show you a picture, you're going to learn from it. And these are little marrow spaces, these little circles, these are little marrow spaces. And they're needed. They're nutrient canals. Remember I told you I was going to talk about physiology. This is what brings nutrition to the bone. So I'm going to tell you this even though we're far away from it, like seven hours, but what I always do is I always treat the tooth first. I want to make the tooth smooth. And in this case, because there's a defect here, I want to go to the bottom of the defect. So I'm going to take a what we call a core spur and I'm going to go around the tooth making sure that the end of this burr, which is a flat-ended burr, is touching the bone and creating a perfect relationship between the bone and tooth surface. This burr has a six-degree taper, so I'm leaving the tooth very, very large. But see what I've done? I've kind of troughed the bone because that's where the defect was. So when I remove <clears throat> the burr, you can see the bone here. And this is more kind of extra bone, really. That's like if there was a tori there originally or an exostosis. And what I basically did is I got the sound bone. If I did not have a reflect re or did I did not reflect the flap, how could I treat this? So when you hear people talk about vertical, you know, deep vertical prep and so on, the bone would have to be perfect for them to get away with it. So there's the before, and I, I 
putting a little trauma there, and I, I have to be honest with you. I want you to look at this. I should have made a little more incision to there. That would have been the better way to do it. Because see, I'm treating this tooth. So I would want at least one more tooth over. What if I had to correct the bone? So this is a mistake on my part. I got away with it, but I don't want you to make mistakes that I do. So basically, the incision should have continued on over to here, leaving the papilla really intact, just, you know, making so you could reflect it. But then you could do a better job of osseous contouring. Once again, my flap is sleeping. Totally going to sleep. I did my osseous. I created a parabolic architecture. See, that was an exostosis present. Remember I told you I felt it with my, my finger? This is what bone should look like. It should come to not quite a knife edge, but it should always be thicker and run smoother to the edge. So there's no real um, thickness there because that tissue doesn't want to go over thick tissue. And for you that do anterior, we'll talk about it later, that's how you get rebound and relapse. Because the bone's too thick, it must be made a certain way. And we're going to cover that obviously in about four or five hours. But we create that same parabolic architecture and learn now. The bone in the frication, if you've treated it properly, will always move coronally. And when we get to doing uh, frication areas, you'll see this every time. But more importantly now, let's take a good look. The tooth surface, smooth. The bone meets the tooth surface perfectly. There's no ledges, there's no pockets, and we created that parabolic architecture, and you all know why. Because the tissue, when it is replaced, will create a parabolic architecture on its own. So now we have the tissue and the bone mimicking each other. It's going to be a perfect relationship. No margin is located on any tooth anywhere when we are finished with biologic shaping, which, again, we're hours away. So...